right, well, excited to uh, get into the Word with you this morning. We're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you want to go ahead and turn there uh, so we can be ready to read God's Word together. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Tonight we have our Inspire gathering at 6 p.m., so this is a uh, really once-a-year uh, leadership gathering we have for our congregation to hear from our elders to vote on new elders, and to share vision for this new year, for 2023. Uh, We will not be streaming that online, so we want to encourage you to be here in person. And right after uh, Inspire tonight at 7.30, we'll have a quick uh, volunteer meeting for everybody who is helping with Disciple Now. And so uh, that's all happening tonight. If you're on the end of the row and there's that little notebook on the ground, if you would grab that and sign in for us, this morning and just pass it down the road to those next to you. We appreciate you taking a minute to uh, let us know of your attendance here with us today at City View. It's just one way we stay connected to you and to also make sure you know what's going on around here in our congregation. Tomorrow is a national uh, MLK holiday, and uh, I, was, I was thinking about that. My memory went back to when our family visited the uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park in Atlanta in summer of 2021. And my whole family, we were impacted by the history and the legacy of Dr. King's ministry and his work. And of course, before we went, we knew about his fight against injustice and discrimination and racism. But what stood out to me when we visited there was how much he talked about the beloved community, uh, what he saw as the desired future on the other side of injustice. A community of people, he talked about often, who loved, embraced, and supported each other, and this was the key phrase, despite their differences. He once said this, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. The type of love that I stress here is not eros, that's a Greek word, a sort of aesthetic and romantic love, Not philia, a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is agape, which is understanding goodwill for all mankind. It's an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of men. This is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. In our own divided generation, we, as the church of Jesus, we have an opportunity to show a better way, to reflect, as I often say, the unity and the diversity of heaven here on earth. I'm grateful to God that City View has grown as a congregation where people from every background and ethnicity, vocation, and generation can come together as one to worship God and, here's the key, to love one another as family. Will you pray with me that we can be a light for Christ in our generation? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the ways in which you have grown us as a congregation that reflects both the oneness and the diversity of your kingdom. Father, I'm so thankful as I look out among this congregation that I see men and women of all ages and races and backgrounds And Father, I thank you that you have united us under the lordship of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that we 
won't just be in church together, but that we would love each other the way you have loved us. And God, I thank you just for the inspiration of reminding us this morning of the power of the beloved community. God, as we open your word now, would you speak to us? Because God, honestly, none of us wants to talk about our money. (laughs) So help us, God, as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Before they won a $2.7 million lottery jackpot in 2005, Laura and Roger Griffiths of England reportedly never argued in their marriage. (laughs) Then they won, and they bought a multi-million dollar barn converted house and a Porsche, not to mention took luxurious trips to Dubai, Monaco, and New York City. Media stories say their fortune ended in 2010 when a freak fire gutted their house, which was underinsured, forcing them to shell out for repairs and seven months of temporary accommodations. Shortly after, there were claims that Roger drove away in the Porsche after Laura confronted him over emails suggesting he was interested in another woman. Thus ended their 14-year marriage. William Bud Post won $16 million in the Pennsylvania lottery in 1988. But he was a million dollars in debt within a year. I wish it never happened, he said. It was totally a nightmare. (laughs) A former girlfriend successfully sued him for a third of his winnings. And his brother, listen to this, was arrested for allegedly hiring a hitman to kill him in hopes he would inherit a share of the winnings. (laughs) After sinking money into family businesses, Post sank into debt and spent time in jail for firing a gun over the head of a bill collector. He told a reporter, I was much happier when I was broke. (laughs) Bud lived quietly on $450 a month and food stamps until his death in 2006. Mark Cuban famously warned lottery winners, if you were unhappy before you had money, you will be unhappy after you have money. It's money you're winning, not happiness. Reader's Digest amazingly reports, are you ready for this? Whether they win $500 million or $1 million, about 70% of lotto winners lose or spend all that money in five years or less. I know, I was like, how is this possible? (laughs) Because here's the truth. Money is not the solution to a hard life. Money is not the healing balm to a broken heart. Instead, money is one of life's great revealers. As I'm gonna say throughout this series, money is a test. What do you mean, Keith? How is it a test? What we do with the money in our hands exposes what is truly in our hearts. We often say here one of the fastest ways to know what you really value is to look at your bank statement at the end of the month, right? To a friend or accountability partner. Does that not freak you out to think about that? Now, This is not what the sermon's about, but it just is interesting. Why does that freak us all out? 
it's like this private part of our lives that we just don't want other people to see. Maybe it's because there's things that it reveals about our priorities that makes us uncomfortable <laughs> that we don't want other people to know about. The truth is, is that every one of us has to deal with money every day, right? It's like preaching on food. It touches all of us. Every one of us has to use money every day to live. You gotta use money to pay for the place you live, to put food on the table, to get to work. It's truly one of the few preaching topics that I talk about that is universal and applies to everyone. And I believe it's because of that reason that Jesus talks about money so often. And when Jesus talks about it, he goes straight to the heart. Jesus said about money in Matthew 6, 24. You ready? Not Keith said, Jesus said, you cannot serve money and God. Don't get mad at me. He said it. You cannot serve money and God. Now here's my translation of that. We will always use one of those two to serve the other. We will either use God to get money or we will use money to serve God. One of them will be first in our hearts. Money is a test. And not just like poverty. Not just when you don't have enough, that is a test. But also abundance. Also when you have more than you need. This is why the Proverbs says in Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9, one of my favorite verses in the whole scriptures. It says this, God, give me neither poverty nor wealth. Feed me the food I need. Otherwise, I might have too much and deny you, saying, who's the Lord? Or I might have nothing and steal, profaning the name of my God. Isn't that interesting? Both wealth and poverty are tests. Why? Because money is a test. Each of these next four weeks, we're going to look at what, one of the ways money tests us, okay? And um, the first of the year is a good time for us to talk about this, evaluate our relationship with our money, and to check our hearts before the Lord. So every week, I'm going to give us an either or. Okay, so I'm gonna say money tests us and either reveals this or this, okay? So our first test today is either pride or humility. Will our money lead us to pride or will we stay humble? That's the question I wanna ask us today. So we're gonna read Deuteronomy 8, all of it, 1 to 20. So if you need to stretch, you know, get ready, stand. Before we stand, let me set the historical context just so you know what we're reading. Deuteronomy was written after the Israelites had been in the wilderness for 40 years. And so they had been on this long journey in the wilderness with God, and they had arrived on the east side of the Jordan River. Okay, you got it in your mind? The promised land's on the other side of the river. So they've been at the end of this long wilderness season, and they're about to go in. And Deuteronomy is like Moses' final instructions to them of like what they need to know and remember before they go into the promised land, okay? So that's what we're reading. So will you stand with me as we read Deuteronomy 8, uh, verses 1 through 20. Thank you for standing in honor of reading God's word. Here's what God says to us today. This is the word of the Lord to us. Carefully follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your fathers. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what, is, what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry, and then he gave you manna to eat which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, 
but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out. Your feet did not swell these 40 years. Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. So keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams, springs, and deep water sources flowing in both valleys and hills, a land of wheat, Barley, vines, figs, and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without storage, where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks are iron and from whose hills you will mine copper. And when you eat and are full, you will bless the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. But be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God, by failing to keep his commands, ordinances, and statutes that I'm giving you today. When you eat and are full and build beautiful houses to live in, and your herds and your flocks grow large, and your silver and gold multiply, and everything else you have increases, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud And you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous stakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of the flint rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers had not known in order to humble and test you so that in the end he might cause you to prosper. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant he swore to your fathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods to serve them and bow and worship to them, I testify against you today that you will perish. Like the nations the Lord is about to destroy before you, you will perish if you do not obey the Lord your God. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen. You may be seated. Feels like that chapter could have been written yesterday. Whew. I want to share with you this morning what we can't forget, what happens when we forget, and then how to answer the test. Now, here's what's happening to the Israelites in this chapter. And what often happens to us, they had been 40 years in the wilderness, right? And often we go through a hard time, a wilderness season in our life. We we are stressed out financially. We're uncertain how we're going to get through the month, how we're going to take care of our family, how we're going to meet our obligations. We get stressed out. And when we go through that wilderness season, it is common for us to go to the Lord for help and say, "Uh, God, I I need you. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I look to you to provide for me. And we commit ourselves anew to God. That financial stress, that wilderness season causes us to depend on the Lord. Amen? Amen? And often when we do that, listen, He blesses us. Now, not in a like name it, claim it kind of way, right? Not in a like, God, I'm speaking a million dollars into my bank account. Not that kind of way. But in a humbling yourself before God, working hard, being honest, honoring God kind of way, right? The Proverbs are clear about this. Laziness leads to poverty. 
Hard work and honesty and commitment to God leads to prosperity. That's what the scripture says. And so often in our lives, when we do what God says to do, God blesses and we come into abundance. But the question then becomes, what do we do with the abundance? And Deuteronomy warns us, we can't forget. Can't forget what? Number one, we cannot forget God's faithfulness in the wilderness. Notice that Moses says God led Israel through the wilderness for 40 years, and he tells them why. Now, if you look at a map, you're like, how did they spend 40 years in this little piece of land? I mean, this should have been like, hey, several months journey, they get to the other side. But God led them for 40 years in the wilderness, kept them in the wilderness, the scripture says why, to humble them and to test their hearts. So friends, listen to me. When you go through a wilderness season, and you will, remember God is with you, God is leading you, and God's working on you. And many times, he is working on you Testing your heart. How will you respond to this wilderness season? Now, if you've been through a wilderness season recently, you know that in those seasons, God's faithfulness becomes so clear to you. You've seen him get you through that wilderness, sometimes in ways that defy explanation. For Israel, it was manna. Like twice in this passage, it says, <laughs> I love this, God gave you something that you didn't even know what it was. That's literally what the phrase is. Your fathers didn't know what it was, but he sustained you. I'm preaching right now. He sustained you in that wilderness season with bread you don't even know what it was. Sometimes Barry will tell stories of growing up with her mom in a one-bedroom apartment uh, on her mom's salary as a secretary, not having enough food to get through the end of the month, and her mom saying, let's pray. And there would be a knock at the door, and there would be a box full of groceries for them. Now here's the key. When prosperity comes, don't forget God's faithfulness in the wilderness. Don't forget that you would have never arrived in the promised land if God had not led you through the wilderness. Woo, come on, y'all. And what I love about this chapter is he says, even more than God gave you manna and water, he talks about both of those, he says, God sustained you by his word. I love that verse. Jesus quotes that verse in Matthew chapter four when Satan comes at him, he quotes from Deuteronomy eight, this verse. Man will not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Because it's when you're in the wilderness, you realize I don't even need that stuff. God himself is the one who sustains me, yeah. right? More than I need to eat bread and drink water, I need to eat God. I need to have his presence, and it's him that sustains me. Yeah. Part of God's faithfulness in the wilderness is that it's in the wilderness that he teaches you to feast on him and to trust him for what you need. And I'll just tell you, you can't learn that in the season of abundance. You can only learn that in the wilderness, amen? Second thing you don't, can't forget, don't forget God's deliverance from slavery. Now Moses is very direct with the Israelites. He says, <laughs> not only did God sustain you for 40 years, but let's go back before the wilderness. How did you even get to the wilderness? Oh, you were in slavery back in Egypt. 
Remember that, Israel? Remember where you were in slavery to Pharaoh and remember that you could not break free, that generations came and went and you were still in slavery and it wasn't until God did 10 plagues and rescued you from Pharaoh and took you to the Red Sea and you look back and the whole army was coming and then God split the water and he walked you through and then he killed off the army with the Red Sea. Do you remember that, Israel? Because if God had not moved, you would still be back there. Now, what is true for Israel is true for every Christian today. The Bible says apart from Christ, we are, and this is the Bible's words, slaves to sin. We are literally enslaved to our flesh, to our sinful desires. We are natural rebels against our creator. And the Bible says in our natural state, we are destined for eternal punishment. The Bible says there is no way in our own power for us to overcome that state, to defeat our sin, to overcome death, hell, and the grave. We literally need supernatural, divine deliverance from our slavery to sin. And only God could do that. This is why the Bible says Jesus came and he died on the cross for our sins. That he rose from the dead on the third day. Now let me be more direct. Our money cannot deliver us. Our money might impress our friends. Your money might even open some doors here on this earth that other people can't enter. But don't ever forget, your money does not impress God. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, In Christ alone, not by net worth. Don't ever forget, no matter how prosperous you become, don't ever forget what God did to save you. Number three, don't forget God's gift of abilities and opportunities. Moses tells the Israelites, to be very careful to not take credit for their prosperity. Did you hear that in the the chapter? Now this one is hard for us to apply because we all fall prey to this temptation. Uh, Verse 18 is the key. He tells them, when you enter the land flowing with milk and honey, don't say to yourself, I love that phrase. What he's getting at here is we all have narratives in our heads, right? There's things we tell ourselves about what's going on. And he says to them, don't tell yourself this narrative. Don't tell yourself my power and my ability is the reason I'm here. Now, I, we read that and you're like, okay, I understand what that says. But let's just acknowledge the truth that we all will tell ourselves that from time to time. Come on, I'm telling you the truth. Myself included, right? You'll, you'll, you'll look at what you have in your life, what's in the bank account, the possessions you have, what's going well in your life, and you will be tempted to tell yourself this narrative. Man, I have all of this because I've worked really hard. And there is a little bit of truth in that, right? There's a little bit of truth in that, that you do have what you have because you've worked hard, because you went to school, because you got that degree, because you put the hand of the plow, you stayed after it, right? There's truth in that. But he says, Be careful about feeding yourself that narrative. Because if you keep feeding yourself that narrative, you're gonna forget the truth underneath that truth. The truth underneath that truth is that the abilities and the opportunities you have are not from you. The bigger truth here is that God has blessed you with every opportunity with every gift, with every ability that you have had. To say it a different way, why were you not born in a different generation? Why were you not born in a different country? 
Why are you good at what you're good at? Right? Like if your answer to those questions is me, that is false. We didn't do anything to deserve the abilities and the opportunities we've been given. So don't ever forget that. If you do, your wealth will go to your head and you will forget the Lord. Number four, he says, finally, don't forget the consequences of following other gods. At the very end of the chapter, Moses warns the Israelites, don't follow idols of the other nations. Now, why does he say that? Come on, I'm going to preach now. They're on this side of the Jordan. They're about to cross. When they go into the promised land, okay, it's not just abundance that's on that side, is there? There's also other nations that are on that side. There's other peoples. And with those other peoples comes other gods. So he says, hey, when you get over there and you get all this prosperity and you get this abundance and you see all the good things that come from the land and your tummy's full and your house is beautiful and all this is going on, don't follow the idols that are over there. Now, the reason this is so important for you and me is because this is really the spiritual war that's happening behind the physical reality of money. What's actually happening to you and I is not just that we are tempted to put our trust in money, but listen to me, we are surrounded by people who worship wealth. We are surrounded by a culture that lives for money. And so it's not just a battle within our hearts, but it's a battle that when we cross into prosperity, when we cross into abundance, we will be tempted to follow the idol of the people around us. Now, why do I say so many live for money? Because we all hear this narrative every day. If I just had a little more, if I could just get to here, if I just had this, then I would be happy. But of course, people keep getting, and they're still not happy. (laughs) Because while money is a useful tool, it's a terrible God. It is a useful tool, but a terrible God. So much so that Moses would say to his people, when you get there, if you follow these idols, just know you will perish. That's what he says in the text. And so I just want to say to all of us, do not believe the lie of the idols of our generation that says if you have enough money, then finally life will have meaning and purpose and beauty. That is a lie. Oh, how many people do we know? How many documentaries have we watched? How many biographies have we read of people that literally have more money than they know what to do with and no relationships with their children? No friends. No genuine happiness. That's what he's saying. There are consequences to following the idols of this world. God says to us, these are the things we will be tempted to forget when we have abundance. Don't forget these truths. Instead, live in reality. Why? Because here's what happens when we forget. Three things. One, we become proud. Here's the test. If we forget where we came from, if we forget how God took care of us, if we forget the source of all of our opportunities, here's what will happen. We will start to take credit for our blessings, credit for our prosperity, and credit for our abundance. And he's very clear what that leads to. Did you see it in the text? This leads to pride. What is pride? Pride is thinking of yourself more highly than you should, Pride is thinking the world revolves around you, that everybody else exists to serve you. And he says in here that if you don't remember these truths, abundance will lead you to pride. God tells his people in verse 14, be careful that their hearts don't become proud. Please, please, if you don't hear anything else in this sermon, hear this. Abundance without remembering God leads to pride. 
And I don't know about you, but I don't want to become that person. I don't want to become arrogant, proud, self-important, self-focused. I don't want to become a self-centered person, right? So he's telling us, if you forget God in your abundance, you will become that way. So don't do that. The second thing is if we forget God, we'll become selfish. This is one of the things that's so wild to me when I study this topic. And every few years when I teach on money, I still kind of scratch my head at this. Is it not wild to all of us that the research shows the more people make, the less percentage they give? I always think that's so crazy. But the research backs that up. Now, of course, the rich give a higher dollar amount in like actual numbers, but percentage-wise, they give less, which is a paradox. Those who have less give a higher percentage of their money away, and those who have more give a lower percentage away. Now, before we think that's too weird, haven't we all faced that temptation? <laughs> you know, like you're working fast food, you're making $1,000 a month, and God says, you know, give 10%. You're like, okay, $100, right? And then you make $100,000 a year, and you're like, man, 10%. Like, that's a truck payment. That's a really nice vacation. It's gotten very quiet in this room, right? Because I'm like, I'm right there. I'm right there. I'm just pressing on what is true. We all struggle with that. Right? And so it's like, oh, okay, maybe not a full 10%, maybe you know, this amount. Because it's just a struggle when God gives us more. If we don't remember him, we'll become selfish. That's what I'm trying to say. And the only way to fight that temptation is to remember God and stay generous. Number three, um, if we forget, we'll become ungrateful. If we forget the Lord and we take all the credit for our prosperity, we will become ungrateful people. In the Bible, what God says is those who forget him, what that literally means is they forget to thank him. They're the same thing. So we have to remember the Lord by thanking him for all that we have. And not just on Thanksgiving Day, right? Not just like when you get around and thank you, God, for all of our blessings, and then you go the rest of the year and you never thank him. No, like part of remembering him is thanking him regularly for what you have. And if you don't do that, you'll become an ungrateful person. We don't want that. So with all that said, how will we answer the first test? Here's the test. Here's the frame. Wealth can make us proud. So if we forget the Lord and we take all the credit for what we have, we will become proud. But gratitude and generosity can keep us humble. If we remember the Lord, remember what remembering the Lord means? Thank, thanking him for what we have and all the opportunities he's given us. And we faithfully give back to him. We stay regular in our generosity. That can keep us humble. So I just want to ask you, which one will we choose? Which one will you choose? Now, before I finish, I just want to remind you... Um, I think the reason this topic is so important to God is because money is never just about money. It's about our hearts. It's about what we worship. The temptation for all of us is to come into this place and to sing praises to God where we're, we're verbally saying to God, God, you're everything to me. You're the center of my life. I live for you. But here's the challenge of this series. Money reveals whether that's true. Right? That's why it's a test. It's, it's literally like God showing us our hearts. Is what I'm saying with my praise what's actually true inside of my heart, in my life? And that's why this topic is so powerful. For the people of Israel... Moses kept saying, don't forget, don't forget, right? He kept pointing them back. Don't forget the wilderness. Don't forget the exodus. What is that for us today? It's the cross, right? Never forget. Never forget. Why? Why does remembering what Jesus did for us 
and never forgetting that, why does that change our relationship with money? Because here's what happened at the cross. The one who literally owns everything emptied himself for you and me. 2 Corinthians says, literally, he who was rich became poor. That's literally what it says. To redeem us. And so if we can remember that, if we can stay connected to that, it changes our hearts. Where when God gives us things, we want to be open-handed. Oh, God, you've been so generous with me. Now I can be generous with others. So friends, don't forget. Let's pray. On behalf of the City View family, I just want to say thank you for your abundant blessings in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for our salvation in Christ. Thank you for pouring out the Holy Spirit to live within us. Thank you for forgiving our sin. Thank you, God, for sustaining us in the wilderness seasons of life. You're a good father. Thank you for blessing us with abundance, more than we need. And God, we pray that we would not become proud but we would stay humble and we would stay grateful and we would stay generous. But God, we can't do that on our own. Holy Spirit, would you touch our hearts this morning? Touch our minds? First, Lord, to remember what Jesus has done for us. to be generous because of how generous you've been with us, God. God, we just thank you and praise you for what an awesome God you are. Hey, Lord, I pray now in this invitation time you would speak and move and change. If there's any here who have not said yes to Jesus as Savior, that even today they would say yes to you, Jesus. And for those of us who have believed in Jesus, that today, God, we would honestly talk to you about our money and where our hearts are. I pray, Holy Spirit, in this moment, you would reveal, you would speak, you would change as only you can do. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.